A big part of the benefit of the digital paradigm is based on being able to make predictions and be able to make predictions. Algorithms are able to make predictions because they know a lot about reality, given all that data. So that's very important. But they also know a lot about reality because they know us humans quite well. And as I said before, what happened here, while we just looked for when Algorithms try to overcome the best of ourselves in order to dominate us. They just need to know the worst of ourselves. And the worst of all that has to do with ourselves. What, what is it? What is it to be a human? And algorithms start to understand that. And that has to do with our cognitive biases. It turns out that pervasive technology learned a lot about our cognitive biases. So that's what we want to talk about in this section and how they exploit it. Let me tell you also a little bit about how this is unintended and how these unintentional side effects of the domination of the downsides of human have come about. I said machine learning, artificial intelligence is machine learning, and you always have to start with asking yourself WTF, what's the function? What is the reward function, loss function, utility function, objective function that that you're giving the machine learning algorithm. And if you don't remember that, feel free to check out the previous lecture where we talked about machine learning, artificial intelligence, and how that, that comes about, because that's important. So what we start with is with some kind of goal input. We talked about the data already, and now there's some goal input. So let's look about a very important recommender algorithm. I talked a lot about Facebook and even Amazon. Let's talk about Google. Let's talk about YouTube and look at the recommender algorithm. Now, the goal of the YouTube recommender algorithm has evolved and it has evolved a lot. Now, it is the secret sauce of, uh, of YouTube as of many social media. The recommender algorithm makes a big percentage of the gains. So let's listen to the vice president of engineering at Google about what is WTF, what's, what's the function, what, what is the goal uh, of recommender engine of YouTube is doing. After responsibility, the most important thing for the recommendation system is satisfaction. So it really depends on which of the two videos the viewer is most likely to find satisfying, which basically means um, which one are they most likely to give more stars to when we ask them later in a survey. And so uh, we find that in general, people tend to be more satisfied when they watched more of the video, which is not a big surprise, of course. All right, so what they did is they asked users, well, what do you find more satisfying? And they find it more satisfying when they watch more of the video. So hence, if I get people to watch more of the video, they are more satisfied. So in an early name of the YouTube recommender engine was called watch time maximization algorithm. So that's what it maximizes for, because maximize for satisfaction. And since they found out the thing, it's that it didn't maximize to keep you on the platform more. And then the blind A-B testing, the machine learning takes a lot of data from you and see like, okay, how can you stay on the platform more? And it triggers you with different things in order to maximize the watch time. Now, if I really want to maximize the watch time, the final goal of it is that I, you cannot not watch anymore. Well, the technical term for that, and that's called addiction. That's why sometimes these persuasive technologies are called addiction machines. Because then the machine learning, the blind A-B testing has absolutely fulfilled its goal. Watch time, watch time maximization. You cannot not watch anymore when you're addicted. And there are several books, bestsellers that have been written over the last decade that uh, bestsellers in, in Silicon Valley that tell you basically, basically some of them are really recipes of how to get people hooked. So for example, this comes from a book really called, called Hook. This is the hook model. You have a trigger, you have an action, you have a variable reward, you give it a little investment, and then you get people hooked, you get them more time on the side. The Center for Humane Technology, from whom I draw from quite a bit today, made an interesting podcast that I invite you to, to listen to with the scholar Natasha Schull, who, who basically studied slot machines in Las Vegas and, and other design features in Las Vegas. And it turns out that, I mean, it took hundreds of years for Las Vegas to discover how to create the perfectly addictive 
casino, how everything is designed, how you walk through, how the slot machines are designed, the variable reward, the, the slot machine, the, the endless scroll. So it turns out that a lot of these features that we have in social media, endless scroll, variable reward, sometimes you find something, sometimes not, uh, they actually reverse engineered a lot of these features that were painstakingly over many, many decades developed in Las Vegas. And they did that in no time, basically by seeing how can you maximize your watch time, which led to this negative side effect that some, some, some of us uh, get, get more or less addicted to these, uh, to these technologies. So, so this is one example. And then I use this as an introductory example because this is a general trend. So where do our weaknesses, these kind of weaknesses actually come from? Why are we, why are we looking for the drive, for, this, for, the, for, for the gambling drive, for this variable reward, for this like always thinking something else coming up? Actually, there is, it's evolutionary programmed in us. So I already talked about the example where you cannot not pay attention to a car accident because it's evolutionary useful. And there are many of these things that are evolutionary useful that give you, for example, these, these dopamine hits as well. They have an evolutionary function. That's when you gamble and you gamble and you're on the slot machine or you scroll social media and then suddenly you find something interesting. You just get this little dopamine hit that you find like, oh, now I found something. Where does this come from? Well, I understand this literature correct. It comes from our ancestors. Because if you're just like one of the other monkeys and you're in the woods and looking for food, it's pretty boring and pretty dangerous. They don't find that you just like you're fed up and you give up. But then suddenly if you find a little bit of food, <gasps> Wow, that's that's amazing. So you keep on going, you keep on going, you keep on scrolling, you keep on scrolling in order to find something. Right? So dopamine and this gambling mentality, let's say we are all descendants of those who had this search for dopamine gambling mentality. Because the other ones, they, you know, they gave up. They kind of like, they're like, like really finding food in this woods and doing this, like, nah, I'm here I'm dying lonely in the desert, right? But the other ones who kind of like kept on going, then we are descendants of those. So we all have that. That, as far as I understand this kind of literature, I'm not an expert in that, but that gives you the general gist of it. So there are a lot of things that we have evolutionary wise that have been useful in the past and maybe still are useful right now that inform our behavior, our our judgment, and then in order to, in order if you want to make predictions of our judgment, uh, it's useful to know what we have in common, our weaknesses. They're called cognitive biases. And to cite Nobel Prize winner Kahneman and his colleagues says, research on judgment under uncertainty, so it's uncertain, we make predictions, typically comes down to the collection of heuristics and, bias, and biases. So these heuristics, these like, you know, I don't know what to do, but I think it's useful to keep on going with that. These are the collections that we call cognitive biases, and they have a reason that they are there. Now, there are many books I invite you to study. I, I studied that for a time. It's really a fascinating topic, rational choice theory and behavioral economics and in, in, in psychology, behavior and decision theories in psychology. Fascinating how, how we humans make decisions. So I strongly invite you to to study that. I studied it some years ago and back in the year 2008 when I last studied that, I found in Wikipedia there were about 53 of these cognitive biases listed on Wikipedia. And you can go to Wikipedia list of cognitive biases, cognitive biases and scroll through them. It's actually a list of them. Now, I recently looked that up again and it almost is five five times more now. <laughs> five times more of these, at least in Wikipedia. And so we did, might have discovered more, we just wrote more about them in our collective crowd crowdsourced uh, Wikipedia encyclopedia. So there are many of them, 226. I saw last time I checked and please check, there are probably more. So let's go through some of them and see like what are these weaknesses that we have that these algorithms discovered in order to then get a predictable behavioral change. It's kind of like kicking you against the shin. So if I kick you against the shin, remember, then I can, I can know how you react. And if I know these cognitive biases, they are heuristics or biases that actually work below your conscious awareness. You are, they are ingrained in us. So once I know them, I know how humankind will react. So let's check some of them out. So we go through our list and, and, and scroll through. And one very important and one very old one is the confirmation bias. I mean, that goes back. Francis Bacon in 1620 said, an opinion draws all things else to support and agree with it. So an opinion draws all things else to, 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 to support it, to agree with it. That's what an opinion does. And Schopenhauer in the 1800s said, an adopted hypothesis 
your guess of what's going on, gives us lynx eyes for everything that confirms it and makes us blind to everything that contradicts it. So we have that in us and it has an evolutionary function because in order to perceive something about reality, we have to kind of like, you know, confirm like, okay, I just saw that, I think it's still there. And I think, yes, that is actually, yes, my memory actually, it confirms reality. So we have to reconfirm reality to us. I'm not gonna go into the psychological and social importance of that, but yes. We need to confirm to make sure like we are still here in the same, we're seeing the same thing, right? Like we are still, and myself, I have to convince myself too. So the confirmation bias is really important for our interpretation of what's going on in this three-dimensional space and in, and in time of this, of this universe. Now, when I give you evidence that's or some, something, a fact, an alternative fact, a fake news or something that confirms your pre-existing belief you are 88% less likely to identify it as fake. Now, also, you have an almost 70% more robust memory, even if I told you afterwards that, you know, that was just kidding. I mean, that was just kidding. I was just, you know, that was just the joke. Like three months later, when I ask you, you will remember 70% more likely with what had confirmed your opinion. So that's how, this is what this happens on the subconscious level. So what the machine then does, it just shows you, because we like that, we, are, we really appreciate it and we remember it. And the machine just discovered that about ourselves, that it caters to the confirmation bias. So the people on the left, it will show more news from the left and the people on the right, it will show more news, to, news on the right. So that's why you have these filter bubbles, this polarization, for example, in the political realm, because algorithms discovered that. What's another one? Let's scroll through our list of cognitive biases. Let's have another bias, the novelty bias. So we are all descendants of those who disproportionately paid attention to something new. The ones who didn't, again, they were eaten by the saber-toothed tiger. But the ones of us who like, we were like always like, oh, there's something new, there's something new I need to pay attention to, then like we had a higher chance of survival and so they had more offspring, so over evolution, we are all descendants of those. So we have that in us, we disproportionately, so for example, imagine hypothetically, there is a new pandemic coming and it's a virus and then uh, they tell you, wash your hands. You're like, I wash my hands, you know, to get sick, I mean, yeah, my... My grandma told me that. I mean, that's not, that's not really new. But like, let's imagine a president goes on stage, a president of a country and says, here is Clorox. Take that Clorox and put it in your way and put it in your throat and put it like, like and you're like, whoa, never heard something like this and you will pay attention to it because you're programmed to pay attention to something new. And the other stuff that would really save your life, you know, you kind of like, you don't, you do pay less attention to that. So we are programmed to kind of like pay disproportionately attention to something new. And that's also why people, you know, 70% of the, of the tweets of some kind of article that is shared, that the people who forward that to you never even open the link, <laughs> 70% of it. And you, maybe some of us are also culprits of that. You know, sometimes you forward a link and that's because we rather consume what's new. Oh, the headline, the headline. Do we really read it? And I was like, no. So this is an outgrowth also of the, of the novelty effect. Now, what this paper here argues is only with the confirmation bias and novelty effect and some others, but mainly there, is one of the reasons why fake news spread six times faster, 20 times deeper and two times broader than True news. Doesn't matter if it's true or not. It's good if it confirms your opinion. It spreads, you spread it because it confirms your opinion. And doesn't matter if it's true or not. As long as it's novel, you will pay attention to it. And that's what these algorithms then, then maximize for. So this is an example of how cognitive biases, and this is just two out of a long list, uh, can lead to that. So let's keep on going with our list of cognitive biases and look at another one. The illusory illusory truth effect or the illusion effect, the lividity effect, the, the reiteration effect is a tendency to believe false information to be correct after repeated exposure. That means if I, if I show you the same thing often enough, you start to believe it. That's also because like we are programmed like this, right? So we saw reality often enough, then we kind of like think like, oh yeah, that thing is actually there. I mean, we have to live in this reality somehow. So once something recurrently happens, we just start to take it as a fact. So when I start to expose that to you, then you start to believe it, even so it might not be true. And actually some disinformation campaigns that happen in, in elections, and there are sometimes some states 
doing disinformation campaigns in other states, and we have studies about that, or non-state but organizations that try to confuse elections in other countries, they actually you know, sometimes take advantage of that. They just placate it. And if you see some of these, so these are some studies, you're welcome to check them out, that show actually almost an algorithm, a recipe of how to do a disinformation campaign to confuse an election. And what scholars who studied that found is that Advertising was not central to the spread of disinformation. Instead, the campaign sought to create memes, videos, or other pieces of content designed to take advantage of the social network's algorithms and their amplifying effect, exploiting the potential for virality on the platform for free. So, example, the confirmation bias and all the effect. Now I make it viral. And then I have the repeated effect, the repeated effect, the virality on the platform, which I get for free. And so I have the reiteration effect, the illusionary truth effect. Because if you always see that and you start to kind of like, yes, that's probably it's true. I mean, that's just what you see all the time. Now, you might be in a filter bubble, but that's it. And during the same time when they did these kind of studies, also Facebook actually employed a former CIA officer as the elections integrity officer. And she, she actually resigned after only six months, because Yale Eisenstadt said, you know, it's, it's the business model of Facebook that exploits our data and showing us each a different version of the truth. That's part of the business model of persuasive technology, right? So that's how far this paradigm has, has already led us. All right, let's keep on going. Well, list of cognitive biases. Let's check out maybe a couple more. The negativity bias. Very important, the negativity bias also leads to one weakness and it leads to the downsides of this paradigm that we're talking about today. So if you have fear on the horizontal X axis, uh, the number of likes or share or comments and on the vertical Y axis, uh, you have how much somebody agrees with it, you can see a positive correlation. So the more likes I have, uh, the more indignant actually the post is. So critical comments get more likes, critical posts get more likes, comments, and shares than other posts. So the more critical you are, the more attention it gets. Why is that? Why do we have the negativity bias? Well, think about that. It's also evolutionary important. Well, we are all descendants of those that disproportionately paid attention to potential threats. The ones who didn't, we were only like, oh, the world is great, the world is great, you know, again. Sable-toothed tiger. So it's it's also natural for us. So the algorithms see like, oh, that's how I actually get attention. That's how I then can also predictively predict their behavior, predictable behavioral change, chi-ching, remember? So, and you can see the difference. So here again, you have the X and the Y. By the way, I know not, not, not everybody here, is, some have a background in humanities. If these kind of things like X and Y axis, if that's something you never heard, please take note. And it's easy to remember like the X axis is horizontal and the Y axis, the Y is a little longer, is, is this the vertical one. That's how we usually in science distinguish it. So the, the horizontal X axis uh, here shows and the Y axis also shows a positive correlation. It says that by adding a single moral emotional word to a tweet, you increase the retweet rate, uh, rate, retweet rate by almost 20%. So that's why people put moral and emotional words to it. Again, we are all descendants of those who pay more attention to moral and emotional messages because that helped us probably for survival. And that's why often the internet and social media is, is full of negativity. Another bias, bias that ends up manipulating us, the law of primacy and persuasion. So as I said, persuasion is pretty old, especially in my field in communication. <clears throat> and here you have, so the law of primacy and persuasion goes back to the 1920s has been set a very influential, for example, in Congress and some cham chamber of democratically elected. It's very important, the order of who speaks and how long they can speak. And like this can speak only after this one finished and you have the filibuster and so forth. So this is extremely important. Or also in juries, in judicial juries, it's the, the order of presentation as a jury is very important. It's meticulously ordered when you have a judicial trial. So the order that you present arguments matter. We know that for, I mean, 400 years as a scientific fact. Now, guess what Google is doing? Well, it orders the arguments that you see by search results. So the recommender engine of any search result, it might be, it might be a search engine like Google or Bing or whatever, or for all the biggest search engines, or it might be, I don't know, in a job market, in a job marketplace that you look for something. And, you know, the prime, the, the order 
of the things that you presented are extremely influential. In this very ingenious study with Epstein and Robinson, I like this study, it's, it's a great study. Basically what they showed is that just the order of recommended articles, the, the order they, they showed you the news articles, they, they didn't even change the headlines. So no fake news against true news, it's just the order of the articles that's presented in some elections that could change undecided voters of between 40 and 80 percent. I mean, that's just insane because usually in an election, well, in our country here, if you have 52 percent, it's a landslide. Or if you have 51 percent, it's even a landslide. If it doesn't turn out like 50 something comma, so usually across the world even, 7 percent margin is the average that an election, a typical election is won. Local elections have a high, much higher margin. But you see, 40 to 80 percent of the undecided voter, that's just, that's just crazy. And that's the power that Sergey Brin and Larry Page, who coded up Google, a search engine, that's the power they have, just not even introducing fake or truth, just like changing the order. And um, that is extremely important. That gives, you, that gives a lot of power and goes back to that, to that kind of cognitive bias, the law of primacy in persuasion. Okay, I'm not going to go into more of these cognitive biases, but feel free. There's a list of more than 200. I, I will end with a, a citation that the Center of Humane Technology uses a lot from E.O. Wilson, who said, well, the problem is we got Paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technologies. And that's basically what we're struggling with. And that's what the technology discovered. They basically reverse engineered, without us coding it into them, blind A-B testing, reverse engineered and discovered our cognitive biases. And it is easy to predict you when in your weakness. And that's unfortunately without any bad intention is what seemed to have happened how machines started to dominate us by getting the worst of us.